It is no show place, this town. Not wealthy, not well known. Before what happened here in December 1944, or even since. For seven days, history paused at a crossroads in this Belgian Ardennes village and then passed on. Unless we can call history the echoes that ring in the memories of the men who make it, as they did in the battle at saint Vith. Not much time for sleeping, eating at irregular hours. The fact was that everyone and every unit was fighting for its own life. You're going to get it, sir. Maybe this is it. Colonel, a C battery is firing at 150 yards. Cold. When you're cold, you stay cold. There's no way of getting warm. We've got no orders to retire. Und es war nicht möglich, etwa St. Viet meinerseits vom deutschen Angriff hier auszusparen. In the fall of 1944, the German army had been fighting for five years. Allied confidence was high, its strength overwhelming, and the halt in its sweep across Europe at the German frontier regarded as temporary. There, the forces of Field Marshal von Rundstedt held desperately, their calls for reinforcements answered by inferior materials or silence. General Siegfried Westfall, von Rundstedt's chief of staff, recalls these days on the Western Front as the most uneasy he had spent, until the day in late October when he learned the reason for the stubborn silence of the Wehrmacht High Command. Hitler received us and informed us that he was planning a large-scale offensive in the West in the near future. We were going to receive 20 infantry divisions and 10 panzer divisions, newly and completely equipped, and the land operations would be supported by at least 3,000 fighters. The target of this operation, which was to be initiated in the area west and south of Cologne, would be the capture of the fort of Antwerp. Three German armies would launch the massive counteroffensive to split the Allied forces and capture their best port of supply, Antwerp. What would end as the greatest pitched battle ever fought by American troops, the Battle of the Bulge, would burst without warning on a quiet sector on the First Army Front. In December 1944, it was held in the north by the 2nd and 99th Divisions, by the veteran exhausted 28th and the 4th Divisions to the south, and by the newly arrived 106th, thinly spread at the center. Conditions were fairly miserable. It was intermittently raining and snowing. We were relieving the 2nd Infantry Division. We, as a brand new, young, inexperienced division were being moved into their position to take up uh, the defense of that particular sector. We were introduced uh, sort of ironically, as I now recall, uh, because most of the battle-tested veterans of the 2nd Infantry Division uh, kept talking to each one of the units of the 106, talking about what a country club uh, area this was to be. Uh, you would sit here uh, perhaps some few shots fired each day. I am Thomas J. Riggs, Jr. I was the division engineer of the 106th Infantry Division. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Oliver Patton. In December of 1944, I was a second lieutenant in an infantry company of the 106th Division. The division landed in France and went into the line and straddled the German-Belgian border about the 9th of December, 1944. Looking back on it now, I think Probably the division was just about as green as I was, and you couldn't be much greener. I was a second lieutenant just out of Fort Benning. The supervision of all preparations was in the hands of von Rundstedt, Commander-in-Chief West. 
Participants in the attack were the 6th SS Panzer Army under SS Group Commander-in-Chief Dietrich on the right, the 5th Panzer Army under General of the Panzer Force von Manteuffel, and the 7th Army at the left wing under General Brandenburger for coverage in the south. While the operation was being prepared, it was important above all to keep this a secret from the Allied forces. All movements were made during the night only. All vehicles in the front vicinity were wrapped in straw to keep the noise to a minimum. But nobody could predict how the situation would develop by December 16th. Von Manteuffel, Westfall, von Rudenstedt, Model. From the beginning, Hitler's generals saw no guarantee of success for the counteroffensive. But the Fuhrer was adamant. His plan was irrevocable. Its key elements were surprise, speed, and to prevent Allied air cover, bad weather, as specified in this basic order from the Wehrmacht High Command. The operation findet the operation will take place only under favorable weather conditions. These will be ordered by the Führer. These sentences induced me to call up headquarters and ironically inquire whether Hitler was now ordering the weather too. The weather did take sides. It was a harsh, confusing enemy to Combat Command B of the 7th Armored Division under General Bruce C. Clark. But the weather was a close ally of 5th Panzer Army Commander General Hasso van Manteuffel. General, I'm reminded of uh, December 1944 when you and I saw these beautiful green and quiet hills uh, all in covered with haze and mist and turning into rain and mud and snow. And I uh, can't help but think uh, how weather played a very important part in that time, as you knew so well. Yes. Ich darf daran erinnern, dass es ja ein Hauptplan war von Hitler. It had been Hitler's plan to start the offensive only during bad weather. And during the days prior to the attack, the weather actually was bad so that the German high command was afraid it might change to clear winter weather and blue skies, in which case your aerial combat forces might have stopped the attack in its very early stage. In fact, the weather on December 16 was just as you described it now. Visibility was bad. The advanced artillery observers, for instance, would have not been able to make out individual targets on the hill. Die vorgeschobenen Beobachter der Artillerie hätten beispielsweise nicht oben einzelne Ziele auf den Höhen erkennen können. But over there, as you will agree, the riflemen had fields of fire. The tanks were also able to recognize their targets at a distance of 2,000 meters. I therefore started the attack very early, at 5 a.m., as you know, to take advantage of the darkness and the bad weather, which would enable us to advance far into these hills you can see here, a typical Ardennes terrain, by noon. Operations, evaluations, and obvious shortcomings became sort of academic on the early morning of December 16th. In this supposed very quiet sector, we suddenly found ourselves hit with an immense artillery barrage that included calibers of guns up to railroad carriage type, landing in all sectors, including the Division CP and San V. Immediately after this barrage lifted, it probably lasted about an hour, 
I started to get reports from my various companies, uh, each one of which was attached to each of the three infantry regiments of the 106th Infantry Division. These reports were excited. Uh, they were, however, objective. Uh, they showed that we were being hit by a fairly massive force. In the 28th Division's area to the south, the opening guns of the offensive aroused the commanding officer of the 112th Regiment, Colonel Gustin Nelson. I immediately jumped out of the bed, ran downstairs, and rang up Division Headquarters, which was then about 40 miles away at Wilts. And uh, I got a sleepy major on the phone. I asked him what uh, was going on in the honeymoon sector, and he said he didn't know. And I said, you better find out. I said, there's either a, a major attack or a raid in force going on there, and artillery's coming in like the very mischief. Even though we in the Division CP uh, thought we understood uh, that this was a massive attack, uh, we encountered great difficulty in getting acceptance of this information, or thought we did anyway, through our Corps and Army to our rear. I really believe that they thought that we were a young, untried division and were slightly excited. However, this same type of information began filtering back to them from our neighboring divisions, the 99th on our left and the 28th on our right. The ser seriousness of this situation finally became evident to 8th Corps later in the day, at which point they attached to us uh, primarily the Combat Command B of the 9th Armored Division, Combat Command B of the 9th Armored Division was led by General William Hope, who was preparing an attack in the north that morning when his new assignment reached him. I then went to St. Beth and reported to General Jones, commander of the 106th Division. He told me that there was a, an attack all along his front and that two of his regiments were partially surrounded to the east of St. Vith. He did not have a very clear picture as to the nature of the attack, but said it was rather strong. He directed me to move to St. Vith as soon as possible. Later that same day, we were also informed by First Army behind 8th Corps, to which we were attached, that the 7th Armored Division would attack through San Beef to our east, and that we were to hold these routes, which were quite vital and a strategic road net in that area, free for this attack. This promised attack or counterattack by the 7th Armored Division through our position uh, is very critical because it influenced all of the the division's decisions from there on out. Since the 7th Armored Division was to counterattack through Colonel Riggs' position to the east, General Hogue was instructed to attack to the southeast when his armor arrived. There, another regiment of the 106th was cut off. But the 7th Armored Division was headquartered some 60 miles away to the north in Holland and there was little urgency in the cry for help that finally reached his commander, General Robert Hasbrook. It was a quiet day, but along about 5.30 p.m. I received a very laconic message from 9th Army which read, prepare your command for movement to Century. Century was the code name for the 8th Corps. I immediately sent for my G2 to learn the situation down there, and from the Shafe situation report, it appeared that it was a very quiet front where troops were sent to rest or to be indoctrinated, new, new green troops to be indoctrinated. After receipt of this message, I decided to send General Bruce Clark, who commanded Com Combat Command B, immediately to Bastogne, the headquarters of Century, to learn the situation and what our probable mission would be. I arrived in Bastogne about 2 o'clock in the morning of the 17th of December 
reported to General Middleton, was told what he knew about the situation, which uh, I was impressed was not too much. And I was told that after I had had some sleep, I would go the next morning to St. Vith and report oh, yeah. to General Jones and move my command there and give him some help. During the first night of the Battle of the Falls, the, infiltra uh, the enemy infiltrated between our lines uh, and into our rear areas. We didn't see very many Germans. Of course, now we know that they were moving in on both sides of us, that we had been almost cut off. Since the Schnee Eiffel is practically covered with trees, the terrain is extremely obscure. The young soldier hears fire from the right, from the left, behind him, and in front of him. Some people advance, others go back. There was quite some confusion, which facilitated our advance through the Schnee Eiffel towards Schoenberg. I met the first prisoners at noon on December 18th, on my way from the northern part of the Schnee Eiffel via Bleialf to Schoenberg. I must say they seemed rather confused. The questioning of young people confirmed that this was a division which apparently had been newly assembled or at least contained a great number of men with no war experience. The operation had been initiated according to schedule. The 7th Army, attacking from the Eiffel front, gained a considerable amount of terrain. The 5th Panzer Army, advancing north of the 7th Army, had also gained some ground, especially since they had apparently managed to surprise the Americans along the entire front. On the morning of the 17th, word reached Sam Fifth of a German penetration coming from the east toward Colonel Riggs' position. The division commander asked me to set up, ordered me as a matter of fact, to set up a defense line astride the schoenberg sanvith road to hold that road for the promised counterattack to the 7th Armored and uh, as an escape route for our two infantry regiments to the front. The armor that might have relieved Colonel Riggs, General Hoag's combat command, had passed through Sandvith at dawn heading southeast on its mission to attack Winterspelt. The 7th Armored Division had left Holland before dawn, but its destination was Bastogne. There, General Hasbrook arrived well ahead of his columns, only to learn that the trouble was somewhere else. I proceeded uh, from Bastogne to San Vith and joined General Clark, who had arrived there some time previously, and we found the situation rather desperate to the east of San Vith. Smoke and noise coming from the woods about two miles east of San Vith indicated German tanks were there, and the only American troops between these Germans and the town of San Vith was a company of the 168th Engineers of the 106th Division. Well, I arrived at St. Vith at 10.30 in the morning, and General Jones needed help. Yes. Uh, then the problem was to get my command that was marching behind me turned off at Vilsam to come to St. Vith. Well, my greatest problem on the 17th of December was confusion and traffic on the road. Oh. Uh, your initial success on the 16th of December had started a lot of vehicles like supply vehicles, extra headquarters vehicles, and uh, service vehicles uh -huh. going to the rear. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This became so uh, severe at the road junction to the west of St. Vith that I had to go out and play military policeman yes. and direct the traffic to get it flowing to the front. And uh, I'm sure that you had the same problem because there's only one road from Prim towards St. Vith through the Ardennes. Exactly the same situation, General. 
On the afternoon of the 17th, I was on my way to Schoenberg in a small vehicle, and I had to dismount because it was impossible for me to get ahead on this road. I then walked toward the front and tried to make myself useful as a military policeman. It was hopeless to try to untangle this column of vehicles when suddenly I heard someone calling in a very loud voice. Way up at the front, I thought I saw a military policeman and I approached him. I saw that it was my superior, Field Marshal Model, who had the same intention as I. So we continued our efforts together and tried to separate the column, but until nightfall on the 17th, a certain confusion and perplexity remained, since we were not able to separate the vehicles. Of course, General, you realize as well as anybody does that battle is organized confusion. Yes. Or at yes. least the job of the general is to see that the confusion is not too disorganized. One human element in the confusion was 7th Armored Division Private Bill Dassinger. Sometime in December we were going down this country road and all of a sudden we come upon this great confusion. Jeeps, trucks, men, equipment going the opposite way. Well, you stop to think, uh, what are we getting ourselves into? And a little while later on, we sure found out. Another was Lieutenant Will Rogers, Jr. St. Vith, down a little kind of a side road. Now, at this particular time, the roads were jam-packed with traffic. All kinds of vehicles coming out of St. Vith. And we had to fight our way very slowly, mile after dreary mile, against this one-way stream of traffic. We arrived at a little town of Poto, which is a little crossroads Belgian village of about, oh, 10 or 12 small Belgian village farmhouses. 7th Armored Division Colonel V.L. Boylan was returning from Paris after a three-day pass. We came back in a Mercedes sedan which belonged to the commanding general at the time. And when we hit a crossroad where we would cut north to Holland to rejoin our units, we saw an armored column moving south and cutting to the east. It looked familiar, so we dismounted, went over and talked to the military police and found out it was our own division. Nobody would tell us where it was going, so we decided to follow it. The armored columns, like hundreds, thousands of other troops and vehicles on the 17th of December, was approaching saint vith Belgium. Converging from every direction, some came in pain and panic, some in cheerful confusion, some in desperate urgency. From the east, battered remnants of the 106th fought back toward friendly lines. From the south, units of the 28th Division were withdrawing before assaults of a magnitude no one could explain. And from north and west, the 7th Armored Division struggled on. Their arrival awaited with mounting impatience by General Clark in San Vip. Why this particular town? Why San Vip? Savit is really a very small place, and then it gained this tremendous significance. When planning the attack on Savit, we knew that it had to be captured at all costs, since it represented a traffic center, a junction of many, some six, eight roads, which cannot be bypassed. Savit had to be taken because all reserves which tried to attack the northern flank of my army, or the 6th Army in the north, had to come through saint vith just as you did. We were therefore very conscious of the importance of saint vith and had planned its capture on the 17th of December. And I proceeded to leave and to join my unit at saint vith Unfortunately, I was unable to join it that night. We were shot off two of the roads and returned and left early the next morning. And I saw that we couldn't get on to saint vith that night. So we went to sleep in a hayloft over a, what was apparently a, di a dairy. The rest of that night was spent still waiting 
for the 7th Armored Division and reinforcing our position. General Clark formed a defense east of San Vies as fast as the troops arrived. They were fed piecemeal into this defensive line. And I fed them in to the point of the horseshoe, which was being held by Colonel Riggs and others uh, to the east of St. Fifth. This went on practically all during the afternoon and night, and uh, all of my troops didn't close into the St. Fifth area until 3 o'clock the next morning. Sunday night, we were fighting desperately to get ourselves in a horseshoe arc position around the town. This area was the nearest to the enemy, the eastern approaches, about 2,000 yards east of the town. American troops under the command of the 7th Armored Division attempting to hold the town away from them. I am Colonel Don Boyer, United States Army, at that time Major 38th Armored Infantry Battalion, 17 December 1944. The first arrivals were the reconnaissance troop of the 7th Armored, which I immediately deployed with their automatic weapons in this skirmish line that we'd established, but placed them on the left side uh, overlooking the open field of fire where they could better utilize their automatic weapons. The rest of that day was spent assembling uh, any other support we could find. Uh, included in that support, by the way, were some medium tanks that we were able to uh, secure from the 9th Armored Division. Eight o'clock, Monday morning, 18 December, we were hit with our first attack. The Germans punched a hole in our lines. We counterattacked and restored the line. Two tanks knocked out, one assault gun destroyed where the enemy losses in this attack. Between 11.30 and 12.30 on that Monday, the Germans again attacked us. At the end of an hour, our line still held, but we had started the long roll of losses. The Battle of the Bulge had begun. More than 50 German columns were now attacking through the Ardennes. There were penetrations everywhere. South of San Vith, the 28th Division was split. Chaos ruled to the east where most of the 106th was surrounded. General von Manteuffel's forces were approaching San Vith itself from three sides. At stake was not simply a town, but the timetable of the Ardennes counteroffensive. And it was already one irrecoverable day behind. Next, part two of the battle at Sandvik.